next we have Doug from Laid Off Dad. Hi. Um, thank you. Good crowd. Um, I want to say, first of all, um, I am indeed the only man up here, but I'm not the only dad. So look out for that. Um, I think that's pretty cool, actually. Um, this is a brief conversation I had with my five-year-old son. Uh, it's called Five Going on Fifteen. It's dialogue, so it has a couple of uh, stage directions, which I will read. Um, and it also references uh, Dinger Ball, which is a game my son and I made up. It's basically one-on-one -on -one baseball, and anything he hits past me is a home run. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just got progressively, he's, he kills me every time now. Okay, so we're, um, it's my five-year-old and I, um, walking back from the YMCA. I hate swimming. Why do you hate swimming? I've told you like a million times. What's so terrible about swimming? Mostly it's everything with the water. I see. It's too hard and it doesn't make any sense and it's just terrible. Are you saying you don't like it because it's a challenge? Because you have to try? Pause. No. Do you remember when we first started playing baseball? How you swung your bat like crazy and you couldn't hit a thing? Uh-huh. Do you remember how you practiced and you practiced? And how you felt when you hit your first home run? Uh-huh. So why do you think you can hit home runs all the time? And now you can routinely beat the snot out of me when we play dinger ball. Because you practiced and you got better. Because you tried. Long pause. Dad, everything you say is completely stupid. Next is Polly from Lesbian Dad. Okay. Hello, hello. I'm the other dad. I guess you could tell. Um, this is Thanksgiving, and I posted it Thanksgiving last year. It was a winter morning when Jennifer and I discovered we were pregnant with our first child our first pregnancy following a very difficult miscarriage nine months before. We were up in the mountains with family at a cabin rented for the holidays. In my journal that morning I wrote two lines on the pregnancy test this morning. Then I left two or three lines blank. Then dawning of belief, muted fits of excitement. We'll test again tomorrow and then maybe rejoice a bit more. Everyone who's been through a post-miscarriage pregnancy knows this studied restraint. How do you stay open, yet protected from heartbreak at the same time? Well, you don't. That morning we toggled back and forth between joy and disbelief. We kept the two lines to ourselves. Later that same day, something happened. I wrote about it. Today a snowbird struck the upper of the cathedral windows of this cabin. There was a dull thud, and at first I thought a snowball had hit. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a few wing beats, then nothing. We went to the window to look out at the deck. There it was, a bird, tiny, face down in the snow, wings outstretched. It looked as if it were kneeling in prayer. I pulled on mittens and jacket and rushed outside. I had no idea what to do, provide the wee thing some warmth, maybe, as it tried to recover itself. By the time I had made it out to the deck, the bird had drawn its wings into its body. It would fit into the palm of my single cupped hand. I'm certain it wouldn't even amount to the number of ounces requiring a second postage stamp on a letter. It had huddled into itself, quivering slightly. I could make out its breaths, which came short and shallow. I cupped my mittened hands close around the bird, reflecting back what little heat it radiated. I squatted in this way for minutes on end, 10, maybe 20, watching its labored breaths, waiting for a sign of more life. 
Finally, I pulled back my mitten cave so it could inspect the chopped sunflower seeds that Jennifer had come and sprinkled beside it. The bird took one hop towards the seeds, then looked quickly side to side, then it took wing. Beat, beat, swoop, out over the snowy deck, over the deck railing and into the snow-covered trees. And it was gone, just bark and snowy branches and the distant occasional shouts of children somewhere playing in the snow. Back at home, I consulted my field guide and learned the bird was a ruby-crowned kinglet. Jennifer and I had hoped that the bird was a harbinger of good fortune to come, a sign from the little spirit who was just a tiny riot of cells, no bigger than a grain of rice, weeks away from weighing as much as the bird in the snow. We both knew that we would believe it when we saw it, a child brought to term, a safe birth, an infant in good health. But after the kinglet, after the kinglet we allowed ourselves a flutter of hope. It's nearly four years now, four years later now, and any night I choose, I can pad into a bedroom and watch two small children sleeping in the glow of the nightlight. One, that one, the larger one with a wisp of hair in her mouth, she was once that tiny riot of cells who first signaled to us with those two pink lines, or was it with the bird? If I wanted to, I could pull up a chair and stare and stare as long as I wished. I could watch as long as it would take for me to fall asleep watching. And, at least today, I feel fairly certain that if I were to fall asleep watching, I could wake to find them still there. For them and for the never taking them for granted, I am thankful beyond belief. For the rising and falling of their breath and for all the love, maybe even simply the chance that brought them to shelter with my beloved and me. I wish love, shelter, and good fortune to you and to those you love. And if you find any of these lacking, may you find at least a flutter of hope somewhere to tide you over.